Well, hello, xenographers everywhere, and welcome to another episode. By the mid to late 70s, lens design had reached a pretty high level of technical excellence, and most, if not all, manufacturers had some very nice lenses to offer. The more exotic lenses from this time are expensive even today, but many more modest ones are not. Today we're going to look at four fast, high-quality 50mm lenses from Minolta, Pentax, Ricoh and Olympus that can be yours from as little as £20. And here's the first, the Minolta MD 50mm f2. This is a fantastic little lens. I hadn't used it until I shot the images for this video, but when I did use it, it really blew me away. It's a K-mount lens, it's very light and compact, and it seems to be made mostly of metal, and although there are some plastic components, the aperture ring for example, this one stood the test of time well. The focus ring is silky smooth, and the aperture ring turns cleanly. Apertures run from f2 to f22, minimum focus distance is a useful 45 centimeters, and the focus throw is about 180 degrees. Fully open at f2, this is already a very sharp lens, and while the corners are slightly soft wide open, they're only slightly soft, and I certainly wouldn't notice it unless I was looking for it. You can shoot this lens wide open all day long and still resolve loads of fine detail. And even up close, depth of field is not so thin that focus becomes too difficult. Stop it down to f8 and it becomes incredibly sharp, resolving very high levels of detail and easily rivaling the resolution even of some modern lenses. This lens has very good contrast, so it's very easy to use with the focus peaking systems of mirrorless cameras, which rely on good contrast to work. And that strong contrast level means that both colour and black and white images have plenty of punch, body and depth. It must have pretty good coatings too, because contrast is maintained even with a light source in the frame. This is one of the best vintage lenses I've used in this regard. Colours seem shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum and are generally cool, which, personally, I rather like. If cool colours aren't your cup of tea though, you can warm it up with a custom white balance. Colours in general seem slightly muted and somewhat restrained, lacking the exuberance and high saturation of, say, an Olympus Zuiko or a Carl Zeiss Jenner. But I do like what this lens does with colour. It makes cool and calm images with a wonderful sense of delicacy. Black and white images are lovely too, with good contrast and plenty of depth and body, with a good tonal range of blacks, whites and greys. Background blur from this lens is some of the nicest I've seen. Up close, it's very soft and smooth, and although it does lose smoothness with different subject to camera and camera to background distances, it doesn't lose much, and it stays pretty smooth throughout the range. Even this chaos of straight lines in the immediate background, usually guaranteed to produce harshness, didn't unsettle it by much. In fact, there was only one shot where blur began to look rough as out-of-focus elements stack up on top of each other, but even here it's not so harsh as some other lenses would be, and somehow it's just that bit more pleasing. So, this is a really nice lens, and it's available from as little as £20. And for a high quality lens from a major manufacturer, it could just be the best value vintage 50mm out there. Next up we have the Pentax M 50mm f1.7 and this too is a really nice little lens. 
being a pentax, it naturally has the pentax K mount. Apertures run from f1.7 to f22. It has six aperture blades. Minimum focus distance is 45 centimeters and the focus throw from 45 centimeters to infinity is about 190 degrees or just over half a turn. This one's in nice condition too. The aperture placed at the back turns cleanly. The focus ring at the front is lovely and smooth and the inside is free of any nasties like haze, fungus or oil. This is another very sharp lens and even wide open at f1.7 it resolves and records a high level of fine detail. If you really look for it there's some slight softness in the corners but stopping down even a little say to f2.8 gives sharpness across the entire frame if maximum sharpness is required. Because of its fairly wide aperture fully open there's quite a bit of vignetting from this lens and corners are significantly darkened. It's only usually a problem if you're shooting against a light background and stopping down to f4 banishes it completely. Like the Minolta lens this Pentax has strong contrast so focus peaking on mirrorless cameras works well and makes focusing really easy. Unlike the Minolta though, contrast can drop significantly if there's a light source in the frame and colours become washed out and weak, so if you're shooting into the light it's best to use a hood. Where there's no strong light source in the frame though, this lens makes strong and punchy images with plenty of depth. It's a cool lens and colours are pushed slightly towards the blue end, although I don't think it's quite as cool as the Minolta. With regard to background blur, well, this one's another smoothie, giving consistently good results across a range of distances. It's very soft and smooth up close and it tends to retain that softness as subject to camera and subject to background distances change and though a little harshness does creep in here and there it's generally well controlled. It's not as well controlled as the Minolta though which seems a little better in this respect. All in all though it's a lovely little lens, small and light with good sharpness and colour and pretty fast too. A good example will cost between 20 to 30 pounds and at that price this has to be one of the best bargains in vintage lenses today. Our next lens is something of a forgotten gem, the Ricoh XR Riconon 50mm f2. In appearance it's very similar to both the Minolta and the Pentax. It's small and light and the focus rings at the front with the aperture behind and I think there's a bit more plastic used in its construction. Minimum focus distance is a bit longer, 60 rather than 45 centimeters. Apertures run from f2 to f16 and it has a Pentax K mount. This one's in nice condition with good glass, cleanly moving aperture ring and a silky smooth focus ring with a very short throw of about 100 degrees, just over a quarter of a turn. Just like the other two lenses, this lens is sharp, really sharp, and even shooting wide open at f2 it resolves an astonishing level of detail, and although there isn't much in it, I think this lens might actually be slightly sharper than the other two. It has good contrast and it's generally very resistant to flare. It usually maintains good contrast with the light source in the frame and it'll even shoot directly into the sun without too much loss of contrast. Catch the light at the right angle though and contrast drops away sharply and reflections from coatings and elements appear and in these conditions it's best to use a hood. Like the Minolta and the Pentax, this lens is cool and colours are shifted a little towards the blue end of the spectrum, although I don't think it's quite as cool as either the Pentax or the Minolta. 
background blur is smooth and soft and is generally very well controlled across a wide range of camera to subject and subject to background distances. Generally speaking, it has similar qualities to the Pentax and Minolta lenses. It's smooth up close, and although the character of the blur changes with distance, it never seems to become too rough, and generally has a pleasing quality. I don't think it's as consistently smooth as the Minolta though, with traces of harshness appearing a bit more readily and a bit more often too. All in all though, this is a great little lens that can be yours from around 20 to 25 pounds. At that price, you just cannot go wrong. Finally today, we have an old favorite of mine, the Olympus Zuiko 50mm f1.8. And if this test was based on looks alone, it would surely win hands down for this is a mighty fine looking lens. Like the others on test here, it's small and compact. It is a bit heavier though, which suggests more metal has been used in its construction. There were several versions of this lens over the years. Early silver nosed versions were single coated and are said to be lower in contrast. Black nosed multi coated versions are supposedly higher in contrast. Between you and me though, I've never noticed a difference and in real world photography, you probably won't either. But just so you know, I'm using a later, reputedly better version for this test. The focus throw on this lens is just under 180 degrees, just about right in my view. Minimum focus distance is 45 centimeters and maximum aperture is f1.8. The little research I've done says that this lens has a planar formula, so is inherently sharp, and that's certainly borne out in use. This lens is very sharp indeed, and even wide open, detail is quite something. While sharpness is good though, I'm not sure it's the sharpest lens in this group, and while there isn't much in it, I think the Ricoh might just beat it by a whisker. The difference, however, is minimal. This lens has very strong contrast, probably the strongest in this group, and while it can wash out with a light source in the frame, it doesn't happen too readily. Strong contrast means images with body and depth. It makes punchy black and whites, but where this lens really shines is colour. The OM Zuiko lenses are well known for their fantastic colour rendition, and this one is no exception. Colours are big, strong, saturated and exuberant. When it comes to colour, this lens does not hold back. In fact, I think it's the nicest lens for colour in this group. With a fastish aperture of f1.8, there's plenty of blur available, and for the most part, it's well controlled as subject to camera and subject to background distances change. Close up, it's massive and smooth as we might expect, but there are points where harshness creeps in, and when it does, it seems a little more nervous than certainly the Minolta and the Pentax, and possibly the Ricoh too. As far as prices go, well, a good copy of this lens will cost between 30 and 50 pounds, which for a beautifully made lens with outstanding color rendition is a very fair exchange. So there we are, four great little lenses from major manufacturers. They'll all make fantastic images and they're all very affordable. Buy one, try one. I guarantee you won't regret it. So that's it from me for now. Please do like and subscribe before you go. And if you like the content on this channel and you want to help it develop and grow, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash xenography. As ever, thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time for some more xenography.